Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Muyantiat Sudayaha Dejo Radi Madam Yata Vini Mayo Yatratri Sargomisha Dam Nas Rena Sada Niras the Kuhakam Satyam Param Di Mahi O my Lord Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O all pervading personality Godhead, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primal cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. <clears throat> it is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge onto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Pojita Kaitra Votra Paramo Nirmatsunam Satam Vedyam Vastavam Atravastu Shivadam tapatrayon mulanam. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Kimba Pareer Ishwaraha. Sadyohidi Avarudyate Tra. Krite Bihi Susubistakshanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold mysteries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God-realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpaturur galitam falam sukamakad amrita dravya samyutam pibata Bhagavatam rasam alayam Mohur ahoraska buvi kaha. O expert and thoughtful man, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to read Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sisugadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all including liberated souls. Sinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hidiyantak Stohiya Bhadrani Vidu Nati Suhitsatam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna who is dwelling in everyone's heart, 
acts as a best wishing friend and purifies a devotee who constantly engages in the hearing of him. Asta presu bhadresu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati tamasoke bhakti bhavati nice to key. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajastamo bhava kamalo badayaschaye chete etaira navidam by development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material loss and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat tattva vijnanam when these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness, becomes enlivened by devotional service, and understands the science of God perfectly. Siyante Chasyakarmani Drishta Evat Manishwari Thus Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a Samsayam Samagram. Understanding the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna or from his devotee in Krishna consciousness can one understand the science of Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16, Verse Number 4. Nijagra hoja savira Talim dig vijaye quachit Ripalinga daram sudram Ganantam go mitu nam pada Translation once, when Maharaj Prikshit was on his way to conquer the world, he saw the master of Kali Yuga, who was lower than a sudra, disguised as a king and hurting the legs of a cow and bull. The king at once caught hold of him to deal sufficient punishment, purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. The purpose of a king's going out to conquer the world is not for self-aggrandizement. Maharaj Prikshit went out to conquer the world after his ascendance to the throne, but this was not for the purpose of aggression on other states. He was the emperor of the world, and all small states were already under his regime. His purpose in going out was to see how things were going on in terms of the godly state. The king, being the representative of the Lord, has to execute the will, will of the Lord duly. Brixit saw that a lower class man in the dress of a king was hurting the legs of a cow and bull. Once, at once he arrested and punished him. The king cannot tolerate insults to the most important animal, the cow nor can he tolerate disrespect for the most important man, the Brahmana. Human civilization means to advance the cause of Brahminical culture and to maintain it. Cow protection is essential. 
There is a miracle in milk, for it contains all the necessary vitamins to sustain human physiological conditions for higher achievements. Brahminical culture can advance only when man is educated to develop the quality of goodness, and for this there is prime necessity of food prepared with milk, fruits, and grains. Maharaj Pariksit was astonished to see that a black sudra, dressed like a ruler, was mistreating a cow, the most important animal in human society. The age of Kali means mismanagement and quarrel. And the root cause of all mismanagement and quarrel is the worthless men with the modes of lower class men who have no higher ambition in life come to the helm of the state management. Such men at the post of a king are sure to first hurt the cow and the Brahminical culture, thereby pushing all society towards hell. Maharaj Pariksit, trained as he was, got the scent of the root cause of all quarrel in the world. Thus, he wanted to stop it in the very beginning. Srila Prabhupada Patita Pavana Ki Jai Gauru Premanandi. So here Prabhupada says, there is a miracle in milk. That, of course, if you say that to vegans, they go, ah, that's crazy, that's not true. But uh, we know that it is true. But of course, cows should never be mistreated. When cows are treated nicely, they're very affectionate. They like people. They like people that bring them treats. And uh, they come running when they see, if you come to the farm, they'll come running. As soon as they see you coming, they'll come running toward you, right? Is that right? Yeah. And they're happy because they know you're going to give them some bananas or some treats. And the way to win the heart of a animal is to feed it. Of course, not the snake, but uh, the four-legged animals. Most of them, they like to be fed. <clears throat> so uh, the maintenance of the Brahminical culture depends on protection of the cow and respect for Brahmanas. Now, those are the two things that are disrespected regularly in Kali Yuga. And someone can make the argument uh, not against not not against the cows. The cows are not mean unless they've been mistreated. But if you treat them nicely, they're very very kind and 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 they respond to affection in the form of uh, feeding them. And they'll give the the best food in the world. It's uh, milk, as long as you protect them. In fact, we saw in the time of Yudhisthira, and, and any time there's a uh, a devotee king, uh, they're so happy that they wet the fields with milk dripping from their udders. And that's the best fertilizer in the world. You don't need anything else. So that, that was the case in the time of Krishna and, and Vrindavan. His father had 900,000 cows, almost 1 million cows. Let's so imagine how much, how many cows that is. You know, and Krishna knew the names of all of them. <clears throat> so uh, happy cows, happy people. Happy people, peace and prosperity will reign in the world because... Happy people, they like to cooperate and get things done, good things to help themselves, help others, and, and to offer to Krishna. So that is Brahminical culture. The Brahmins are uh, very austere, uh, but they're very kind, and they're generous. They, they give in charity. They receive charity, and they give in charity. They don't hoard anything. And they have a very simple lifestyle. 
They don't need gold chains and gold rings and big cars and things like that. Uh, they're satisfied with very little. Therefore, they have a lot of time to do good to others as well as uh, study the scriptures and explain difficult things to people so they can understand what the purpose of life is. However, the age of Kali means mismanagement and quarrel. And that we see that everywhere in the, in the world, in all governments, mismanagement and quarrel. And the root cause of all mismanagement and quarrel is that worthless men with modes of lower class men who have no higher ambition in life come to the helm of the state management. So we see this, especially when kids go to, to college. They learn all kinds of nasty things, not necessarily in their courses. Of course, the courses all are nonsense also, but nasty things like illicit sex, intoxication, and all kinds of uh, uh, dares, you know, just like when kids are together, they like to dare each other. Just like in Australia, uh, a group of kids were together and and they dared one kid to eat a slug. And they put one in front of him. And all of a sudden, he grabbed a slug and put it in his mouth and swallowed it. And then he got what's called uh, a slug rat... Uh, the slug rat disease. Uh, he became a vegetable after that, just by swallowing the slug. And then the bacteria in the intestine of the slug got into his bloodstream, went up to his brain, and destroyed, basically destroyed his brain. He couldn't function anymore. And there's pictures of him. You know, he's, he's just looking out in space. He, he's just completely... Uh, inattentive, he can't, he can't conceptualize anymore, and eventually he died. Just on a dare. See, this is what kids do. They come together, they, they do crazy things. Uh, and uh, therefore, and then when, as they're getting more and more educated, they're getting educated to be animals nowadays. And, and once they get to college, especially in the fraternities, they, they act like animals. They're mean, they're vicious, they like to see others suffer, and they like to take intox intoxicants and do goofy things. And then the music they listen to and the words of the music, <laughs> like that, you know, just rat music. I call it rat music. So you end up being a rat by listening to it. So. This is what's going on, is the culture. So uh, it says that low-class men become the leaders of society and they have no higher ambition in life than to simply rip people off and uh, enjoy sense gratification. And such men at the post of a king are sure to first hurt the cow and the Brahminical culture, thereby pushing all society towards hell. So, Namo Brahmanya Devaya, Go Brahmanahitaya, Jagatitaya Krishnaya, Govindaya, Namo Namaha. So, this is a very important verse. And, what does it say? It says that, it's in the 14th chapter, let's see where it says, Or is it the 16th chapter? Yeah, the 16th chapter. Basically, it says that uh, in the age of Kali, uh, the, the demons will uh, mistreat cows and brahmanas and thus create a hellish situation. And therefore, all society becomes disrupted, people become degraded, and eventually, uh, there's just uh, 
a horrible situation. So therefore, it says, my dear Lord, you are the well-wisher of the cows and brahmanas, and you are the well-wisher of the entire human society and world. It's Vishnu Purana 1, 1965. The purport is that special mention is given in, that pr in this prayer for the protection of the cows and the brahmanas. Brahmanas are the symbol of spiritual education, and cows are the symbol of the most valuable food. These two living creatures, the Ramanas and the cows, must be given all protection. That is real advancement of civilization. In modern human society, spiritual knowledge is neglected and cow killing is encouraged. It is to be understood then that human society is advancing in the wrong direction and is clearing the path to its own condemnation. A civilization which guides the citizens to become animals in their next lives is certainly not a human civilization. The present human civilization is, of course, grossly misled by the modes of passion and ignorance. It is a very dangerous age, and all nations should take care to provide the easiest process, Krishna consciousness, to save humanity from the greatest danger. But this is a fact. It's saying, Prabhupada is saying here, that this Kali Yuga is a very dangerous age. Why? Because people are being grossly misled and misled by people or so-called ru rulers who are in the modes of passion and ignorance. So do we understand how dangerous this age is? Do we understand how people are purposely mis so-called educating or, or misleading our children through all kinds of false things? So I wanted to discuss something very interesting to, today. Um, the uh, One of the most famous people in the 20th century was Einstein. And Einstein had a very particular point of view about God and religion. He definitely said over and over again that he did not believe in a personal God. And when he was accused of being an atheist, he definitely said, that, no, I'm a believer. I just don't believe God is a person. But I believe in, in, in the God of Spinoza. Spinoza was a Jewish philosopher. And he believed, he was basically a Mayavadi. Right? So <laughs> uh, when, we, when we hear, and that's, now Einstein was a very smart person. But when it came to this question of God and science, and religion and science, uh, he had what you would call an ambivalent point of view. Ambivalent means it's, it's shifting all the time. He was never, he never completely uh, came to a, uh, what I would call a definitive understanding. He was and he wasn't a believer. And the thing, the reason why he he was a believer was because of the science. Because as a great scientist, not a mediocre nonsense scientist, and most scientists today are mediocre and nonsense. He was a he was a real scientist, right up there with uh, uh, Galileo and and Newton and uh, Planck and all these guys. They were very brilliant men. So he saw that there was order and organization and mysticism in nature. Mysticism was there are things that he, that he couldn't understand. And he tried to understand it. He tried to, to his, his life's work after he got all his Nobel Prizes and his fame was to find the unified field theory in which he could explain all of of nature with a few uh, uh, formulas, but he couldn't do it. He couldn't, he couldn't, and they still can't do it till today. Now, this is a big subject, uh, but in any case, I don't want to go too deep into it in that way, but I want to read a few things that he wrote and show you how sometimes he seemed to believe in God, and sometimes he rejected belief in a personal God, and then talked about this 
universal uh, impersonal God. The, the, that, and he got that from Spinoza. So it says, in the question of free will, like Spinoza, Einstein was a strict determinist who believed that human behavior was completely de determined by causal laws. For that reason, he refused the chance aspect of quantum theory, famously telling Niel Bohr's, God does not play dice with the universe. In letters sent to the physicist Max Born, Einstein revealed his belief in causal relationships. He, he's, he writes to uh, uh, Max Born, You believe in God who plays dice, and I in complete law and order in a world which objectively exists, and which I, in a wildly speculative way, am trying to capture. I firmly believe, but I hope that someone will discover a more realistic way, or rather a more tangible basis, than it has been my lot to find. Even the great initial success of the quantum theory does not make me believe in the fundamental dice game, although I am well aware that some of our younger colleagues interpret this as a consequence of senility. So, you know, I mean, obviously he can express himself very eloquently. What he's saying is, look, you guys believe in the dice. That is, it all happened by accident. He said, it, he's basically saying it's not possible. There's so much order. We don't even understand it all, you know. And when I uh, say, look, God doesn't play dice, uh, See, he's mentioning the word God, right? So it looks like he believes in God, but the God he believes in is actually, and in other places you'll say, I'll quote, I'll, I'll read another quote, where he said, I don't believe in God. You know, I, I believe in my God. This impersonal thing that Spinoza was talking about. So uh, what he's saying is, you guys believe that you know, God throws the dice. In other words, it all happens by accident. Everything happens by accident. He said, uh, that's not a fact. Uh, why? Because he's a real scientist. He knows that there's too much order in the society, that, in, in creation. There's, there's too many mysteries. And, and uh, he hasn't even scratched the surface of finding out those mysteries. And he's the greatest scientist in the 20th century, right? And, and Newton said the same thing. He, Newton said, and he was the greatest scientist up until Einstein, right? And Einstein's right up there with him. Right. Newton said, we've only, uh, we've only understood a few grains of rice in the vast ocean of knowledge. Now, he's, he's, you know, just get the idea of what he's saying. You know how many grains of rice there are in the ocean? Not infinite, right? And he's saying, all we've done so far is just analyze a few grains of them in that infinite ocean of knowledge. And Einstein's saying the same thing. He's saying there's a mystery. I I tried to understand it, but I'm i you know I'm just scratching the surface of it. I don't I don't really understand it. Uh, but I, what I see is there's so much organization, and and nature is, is causal. There's a cause and there's an effect. Somebody set this up, and we 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 can't really understand, uh, you know how it's set up. We're trying. We we've only understood a little bit about how it's set up. You know. So uh, it's very interesting when you read Bhagavatam, you can see that all the answers that are open-ended for Einstein are answered by the Bhagavatam. Okay. This is what we should be teaching our kids. They should understand this. They, we can go up against the top scientists and philosophers of the world and point out most people are not going to read this. You know, they're, you know, they say, oh, Einstein is a great guy, you know, but they, they don't understand anything about the man. Just a few, and the people that's, that claim to understand about him, they want to make him out to be one of them, either an atheist or a believer in the, in the vengeful God. See, he, Einstein didn't like the God of the Bible because he's too vengeful, you know. He, he, he punishes people. Actually, See, because if Einstein had met Prabhupada or Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he would have been amazed. Who did he meet? He met Rabindra Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore, who was a Mayavadi. <laughs> There's a picture of him with Tagore. He was very impressed by Tagore. 
it was Tucker was talking his Mayavad nonsense to him, and it made sense to him because Spinoza also is a is a nonsense impersonalist, right? But if he had met Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he would have become a devotee. I'm almost sure of it. Bhakti Siddhanta would have defeated him. Or Prabhupada. But he wasn't that lucky. So this is what our kids should learn. They should understand. These are the biggest thinkers in the in history of mankind. And they're confused. And they end up at the most being Mayavadis. Because as long as one is in the modes of passion and ignorance, there's a quote by Prabhupada, they can't go past the, my, the impersonal understanding of God. You have to come up genuinely to the mode of goodness and then transcendental goodness to begin to understand Krishna. So anyway, I just want to make a little introduction of this. Uh, and this is what I'm going to te be teaching our kids from now on. We go right up to the top and see how Bhagavatam has the answer to all the questions. And, Tom, and Einstein had plenty of questions that were not answered. Even up to the point of his death, he was still seeking to find out about, you know, is there actually a personal God in the universe? He kept saying, I don't believe there is. But that was out of frustration. On the other hand, he kept saying there has to be something because there's too much organization there, and we don't really understand how it happened. Hari bo, all glories to Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Are there any questions? Well, yeah. Well, because they learn to speculate in college. They're right through school. They're they're taught to speculate. They they say think the they think the speculation is the way to understand things. They're taught to reject authority and to speculate. That's why it's dangerous to send your kids to these schools because that's the way they're going to be taught. Yeah. Well, look, what do they do in the modern dairies? They separate the calf from the mother cow, right from birth. And they feed it uh, some milk that comes from the cow, right? <laughs> but they keep it separate from the, the uh, mother. And then and they wean it off the milk to, to uh, you know, grains and grass. So... Uh, okay, the point is that we follow authority. Krishna was a cowherd boy. The whole, if you study Govardhan Puja, the whole culture of Vrindavan is in the story of Govardhan Puja, in which they order, they, they offer to Govardhan Mountains of sweets, milk sweets, right? And plus other things, vegetables and rice and all that. But there's a lot of milk sweets, and Krishna himself liked to eat ladus and so forth. So we follow authority. If Krishna likes that, that's what we like also, and that's what we offer him. So what, we don't care about the vegans and all their theories, which are speculative theories. Before they were vegan, they were given milk, right? And they grew up. They didn't die. And the cows didn't die. There's plenty of cows. In fact, they keep killing the cows, and the cows keep increasing, you know. So uh, they're all false theories. We, don't, we, we follow authority, spiritual authorities. So Prabhupada drank milk. 
Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati drank milk. The uh, great yogis, they live only on milk. So we don't care what the vegans say. They don't know what they're talking about. You know? We do accept one thing, that you should not mistreat the cow. So we, in that sense, we agree with the vegans that we shouldn't mistreat the cows. And they're treated horribly. That's no doubt about it. They're treated horribly. But uh, we don't agree with their speculations. Haribo. Yeah. But the main point is we follow spiritual authorities, our, our acharyas. They're not our, the vegans are not our acharyas. Now, there's a right way and a wrong way. So there's a right way of taking care of cows. And the cow, when they're treated nicely, they give much more milk than the calf can drink. And we let, I mean, in, in our farms, we let the calves drink the mother's milk for at least three, four months. And by that time, they're weaned off of the milk to, uh, to grains. Yeah, yeah. Personality of Kali. The personality of Kali? <clears throat> well, the... Uh, Okay, here's the point, that the material world is, is like a prison house, right? So there's going to be people uh, in a prison who are uh, bad people. That's, that's, that's what a prison is for. It's for the bad people. Now, they can be uh, rehabilitated, or at least those who want to be get out of the prison, they can be re rehabilitated. So we're all prisoners. We're all, while we're prisoners, why, why are we in the prison? Because we revolt against God. So we're all like Kali. Right? And, then, and you can see, as so many people are eating meat, being mean to animals, and mean to Mother Nature in many ways. So it's not just one person. There are many people. That one person is representative of many people in this age. So, but even Kali had to surrender. Kali surrendered to uh, Maharaj uh, Parikshit, right? And then he asked for mercy. So, and that's what we're going to read about in this section, right? And uh, Maharaj Parikshit, as, as a genuine devotee, uh, gave him some con concession, some place where he could exist. So, uh, just like, were you, were you eating meat before? Never? Okay. I was, right? But uh, I was given a chance to uh, introduce the Krishna consciousness by uh, Prabhupada's devotees and Prabhupada himself. And... Uh, uh, you know, I've been rehabilitated, let's say, say it like that. So there are many people like that in this age that are, re re are rehabilitated. Like, for example, you, you were like, what, worshipping demigods? Okay. Yeah, you didn't know. So you were, rehab you were rehabilitated also by meeting devotees, you see. So we're all like Kali. We're all born... Uh, low class, and especially in uh, Kali Yuga, Kalo Sudra Sambhava. And, uh, but we have a chance. Just like Kali was given a chance by Maharaj Pariksha. He didn't kill him. He was going to kill him, but Kali surrendered to him. And he gave him a, a chance. He could stay in a certain place wherever gold, gold is hoarded. But wherever gold is hoarded, Eventually, all the four regulative principles are broken. Therefore, Kali, you know, after Maharaj's Rikshit's disappearance, and Kali Yuga developed. So, because he was given a place to stay. He was not killed. 
So the, the main theme in Krishna consciousness is, and Prabhupada says this, and this, this is what will uh, uh, convince people like Einstein that there is a God. He said in Krishna consciousness, as opposed to like Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the Abrahamic religions, there's no punishment, there's only reward. Now that's a hard thing to, for people to understand, and and that's something that we'll talk, I can talk about, about that more tomorrow, and I'll show you where Prabhupada said there's no punishment in Christian kinds, only reward. Now what may appear like punishment is actually a reward, just like when uh, Narada Muni curses the sons of Kubera, now the Kubera and Manigriva, right, because they were. They were drunk, and they remained nude, nude in front of him, right? So he cursed them. But his curse was actually a blessing. So you see, in Krishna consciousness, there's no punishment. It's only reward. And later on, they realized that their curse was actually a blessing because they were cursed to be a lizard. Or in, they were not, not, not them, but they were cursed to be trees in Vrindavan. And after 60,000 years or so many years, Krishna appears and liberates them. So this is something that's difficult for people to understand because in, in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, God is vengeful. And he gets angry and destroys the whole human race, you know, and then realize I made a mistake and then, then uh, recreates them again. <laughs> so... You see, there's stories like that. That's why Einstein, he's, 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 he was a Jew, but he, he, he didn't believe in the Bible. He said, there's a bunch of silly stories. There's some morality in there, he said. That's, that's okay, but the, the stories are all silly stories. And he's being a little, he's exaggerating a little bit, but, but in, in a sense, especially in the Old Testament, there are many things that, you know, it, it just sounds silly. And it makes God look like he's vengeful. Whereas Krishna consciousness, it, when Krishna kills Sisupala, he actually liberates him. And he kill and, he, and, and all of Krishna's activities is actually liberating. You know, it's, it looks like punishment, but actually it's it's uh, it's mercy. So this is a big topic, and that's why unless people hear from acharyas, they end up like Einstein, who's such a brilliant person, end up with the wrong conclusions. Okay, we'll stop. Yeah. Very simple. Why do you need the personification? Sin. Sin. And the That's why the definition of But he's still a person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so sin person. Yeah. Well, you can say most people in this age are agents of Kali because they're they're engaging in those sinful activities. Yeah, yeah. They're taught to do it. An influence of Kali. Yeah. Kali He's only powerful uh, uh, to the degree that we're weak spiritually. Yeah, for the ordinary living entity, that we get influenced by the modes of nature. But we have no power. So in the back end of it, says, Kali Kukura Kadamba Chauri, Kali Vapavana Kadua Sana. Similarly, 
Caribbean marriage gave Kali a place where they sinful. Yeah, Kali is a person. He's a person, right? So anyway, uh, what what's the question now? Demigods are not demons. Yeah, it's personification of sin, right? So, yeah. But he has his role. He has his role. He's not a dumb person. He surrendered to you, uh, to Parikshit, right? And he got a place to stay. So that means it was inevitable that Kali Yuga is going to take place. It's only by mercy, Lord Chaitanya, there's a window uh, in Kali Yuga of 10,000 years where you can get out. Okay. Satan, yeah. They're playing with the puppet. Those strings are the modes of material nature. Yeah. Uh, you're not allowed to kill unless you can bring the person back alive. So that's why in Kali Yuga, all those types of sacrifices are forbidden because the Brahmanas don't have the power anymore to bring them back alive. But in previous ages, they could bring dead animals and dead people. They, they also had human sacrifice. It's not only they sacrifice horses and cows, they also sacrifice human beings. And th there's the story of Harish Chandra. And you'll see, you you he wanted to ha sacrifice a, a child in place of his own child that was destined to die. But uh, Vishwamrita Muni got really upset hearing about this, so he taught that child a mantra. And when they put the child in the in the fire, instead of burning to death, he remained alive. And you and and he, because he. He recited the mantra that Vishwamrita Muni gave him, and then he walked out of the fire, unburned. So, uh, at Brahmanas in previous ages, in Dwapara Yuga, Treta Yuga, Sati Yuga, they had the power to bring dead people back alive. So they would sacrifice a cow, and then uh, they were able to rejuvenate it into a calf. So, they they had the right to kill because they had the power to bring back to life. But that power has, has been lost in Kali Yuga because they can't chant the mantras correctly. Therefore, horse sacrifices, cow sacrifices, all those sacrifices are forbidden in this age. Okay? Well, because Arjuna is an eternal uh, companion of Krishna. He always appears with Krishna wherever Krishna is appearing in the material world. He's always with him. Right? So, the Nara Narayana incarnation, Arjuna is Nara. And Krishna is Narayana. And then, in, in this incarnation, is Krishna and is Arjuna. They're always together. And Arjuna has a position of uh, looking like an ordinary uh, 
person in the sense, it wasn't ordinary, but he looks like an ordinary person because he wasn't a yogi. He never did any asanas or pranayamas or any of that stuff. And he was basically a killer. Not a murderer, but a killer, you know. And Krishna chose him, although Vyasadeva was present, Narada Muni was present, they were all present uh, 5,000 years ago. And all these great sages were present, and then his brother Yudhisthira. But Krishna chose Arjuna, because Arjuna looks like an ordinary guy, you know. He's, he's not some big pundit, he's not uh, some big uh, yogi, and he's not uh, uh, doing karma kanda either, you know. He's, he's, a, he's a fighter. But uh, Krishna chose him because his qualification was he's Krishna's friend, and uh, he's not envious of Krishna. And uh, uh, it says, Bhaktosi me sakacheti, and he's also his devotee. He's a devotee, he's a friend, he's not envious. Krishna chose him. And he wasn't some big yogi. And, you know, he was just, he was, he was a chatriya. Yeah. Yeah. Even the demons that he killed, most they were all associates of his in some way or other. Yeah. So what's the what's the what's the relationship relationship all this Kali and the Kali relationship? No. I mean, they're two different persons. You have to see if the A is long or the A is short, you know, see how it's spelled. Yeah. There's a personality of Kali. Yeah. But, but personality of Kali is in Kali Yuga. Uh, and the personality of Kali, uh, like Mother, you know, Mother Durga's horrible personality. She has 108 different manifestations. And, but as Kali or Bhadra Kali, like that, she's like very scary. Is it Durga also Kali? Durga has 108 different manifestations. One of them is Kali. Yes. Yeah. Some of them are nice and some of them are horrible. I know the story of uh, Yeah. Right. Well, she, he was taken into a temple of Kali to sacrifice him to right. the God, right. for the deity of Kali. And she got really upset and she walked off the altar and the uh, cut the heads off of the dacoits that were trying to kill Jad Bharat and drank their blood. And Jad Bharat didn't even battle eye eyelash, you know, I mean, he, he, just, he just remained neutral and then when, the, when all that was over, he just walked out. <laughs> so it didn't affect him, you know, I mean, he was completely surrendered to Krishna, right? So, and Kali, you know, because they, they wanted to offer a, a pure devotee to, to her, she, yeah, she's a devotee. She's also a devotee, right? So, yeah, so therefore we should become devotees, but well, the only protection we have. Okay.